All right, I'm sure it's the one you've all been waiting for. It's time to do a preview and game-by-game game prediction for the most overhyped one-win team in the history of college football, the Colorado Buffaloes. The Fighting Primes. Let's go. Uh, yeah, good morning, and that it's Uncle Lou here. Yeah, that's right, it's me, Uncle Lou, live on YouTube for you. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. Also, in tune to that as well. Subscribe to the channel if you're not already. I post college football videos almost every single day of the year. And believe it or not, some of them are actually watchable. I don't know about this one. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes uh, the, the finished product, a lot of times, is only as good as in the, the ingredients, right? Colorado today. This is going to be a weird... Subscribe to the channel, though. I, I post pointless uh, college uh, football videos year-round, call-in shows, live streams, all that kind of stuff. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Th this is a pretty average channel here, but we have a great community of commenters and uh, participation uh, in the call-in show and things like that, so make sure you stick around. But this is going to be like unlike... Th this is going to be unlike any preview or prediction video I've ever done in the past, you know? Normally, I spend a lot of time in these prediction videos talking about how the team did last year. Now... How a team did last year is not a guarantee, obviously, on how a team's going to do the following year. But you usually have a lot of players that are coming back from the year before, right? Maybe a team had a true freshman quarterback last year, okay? Well, you would expect a lot of improvement, right, in, in the next year from that quarterback. So you have to look into all those things, who graduated, all, all that kind of stuff, right? That's out the window when it comes to Colorado. There are less than 20 players on this Colorado team from last year's Colorado team. I think everybody who pays attention to college football this time of year is well aware of what has gone on at Colorado with the turnover they've had on the roster. While this is not something completely new, Lincoln Riley did this at Southern Cal last year, but to a lesser degree, this is the first... We're basically seeing what Colorado... I, I was trying to think of an analogy to use for Colorado in 2023, and I really couldn't come up with one in the world of college football. First of all, the transfer portal is still relatively new, right? We've, it's only been around a few years. The transfer rules have only recently loosened to the point where you're, you're, you're seeing this kind of activity in terms of transfers. And even like Lincoln Riley that I mentioned that did this last year, you're talking 25 players or so through the portal, right? Colorado brought in 51 I was trying to think of some type of analogy to compare this year's Colorado team to. The best I could come up with, and you let me know what you think about this. This is basically the college football version. What we're going to see in 2023 is basically the college football version of an NFL expansion team. That's the closest analogy I could come up with. I don't know if you, uh, how many of you were around or paid attention the last time the NFL expanded what was it the, the, the uh i know the panthers uh have 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 come along in my lifetime but anyway when with an expansion team in the nfl it's not a team filled with rookies or first year players right they're allowed to go out and get certain players from other teams they get extra draft picks there, there's certain things the league will do to sort of stock that team up with players right this is kind of what we're seeing at colorado um, I mean, clearly there's going to be some freshmen on this team. They did have a recruiting class. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And clearly some of these freshmen are going to play. But the majority of this team that we're going to see in 2023 from Colorado are experienced players. It's just all of the experience occurred somewhere else, whether it was players that traveled with Dion from Jackson State to Colorado or whether it was uh, transfer portal situations where they went out and got kids from other schools. It, it's going to be an interesting season to watch Colorado, even if you're not a Colorado fan, even if you're not maybe that interested in the Pac-12. Um, you know, maybe you you grew up like I did watching Deion Sanders play, so you sort of have the interest from that angle, right? But it's going to be very interesting to see if this works out because I think there's a lot of people watching this. Um, a lot of curious eyeballs are on this situation in Colorado. And I'm going to be honest, there are a lot of people, I think, that are sort of rooting for Dion to fail. Um, I'm not one of those people. I'm a Dion fan. Uh, I, now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know, I don't think Colorado is going to be very good in 2023 in terms of an overall record. And again, we're going to get into all this in a second. They were 111 last year, completely new team this year. 
it's not because I don't like Deion Sanders or have anything against Deion Sanders. I, I grew up watching Deion Sanders take helicopters from Falcons games to Braves games. You know, I live in Georgia. I mean, it's, it's, I mean I'm a Deion fan. Um, <clears throat> I grew up watching him play. I don't know whether it's going to work or not. But for better or for worse, um, sort of the approach that Dion has taken is a very kind of in-your-face type of attitude and approach. Uh, whether you're talking about the way he dealt with the existing players at Colorado, basically telling them to pack their stuff and get out in a lot of cases. Um, he never says no to any podcast or interview. He's all over the place. He films his own show, right? He's got cameras everywhere. He did it at Jackson State. He's doing it at Colorado for the TV show that comes on, I think, Amazon Prime. He's very... Uh, I don't even really know what the word is. He's very uh, boisterous. He's very uh, he, he's flamboyant. He's loud. And again, I'm not here to say any of those things are bad. But Dion has spent a lot of time, effort, and energy garnering attention. And when we start playing games in the fall, he's going to get all of that attention he's been looking for. If Colorado wins, the praise is going to be heaped on unlike anything we've ever seen before. If he falls on his face and loses, there are going to be a line of people from here to East Jabib to point and tell you I told you so. It's going to be interesting to see how this uh interesting to see how this plays out. Shout out to everybody over on the Uncle Lou Patreon page. I made a post several weeks ago now about these prediction videos and I asked y'all to leave a comment about which teams it was you wanted to see me do a preview and prediction for couple of you mentioned Colorado over there on the Patreon page. So shout out to Kendall J and DT. Yeah, I appreciate y'all supporting the channel over on the Uncle Lou Patreon page. They both wanted to see a Colorado preview and prediction video. So here we are. We're going to knock it out today. There's a link to the Patreon page in the link in the description of this video. If you want to check the Patreon page out, it's a great way to help support the show and the channel. I really appreciate all of you uh, who are members over there. All right, the Colorado Buffaloes, let's get into it. Now, I'm going to skip the part of the video where normally I talk about last year and what they did and who they beat and who they lost to and who they, what players they lost and what coaches they lost and what players are coming back and what players they lost and the one or two players they got in the transfer portal. I'm going to skip all that uh, because it doesn't matter in this case. It literally does not matter at all what Colorado did last year, not overall as a record, not overall in terms of stats as a team, um, not specifically against certain teams or another. Literally, none of that matters in the case of Colorado. Like I said, this is basically an NFL expansion team type model. I don't mean that this team is loaded with NFL players. I mean, these are all new players. Less than 20 players remain from last year's, uh, from last year's Colorado team. And that brings me to a point, if you don't remember anything else about this video, I want you to remember this. Oh, I know you're going to remember the, the, the record prediction I give at the end so that you can show up when the season is over and point and laugh at me for being wrong. So two things you'll remember, the record prediction. And then I want you to keep this in mind too, because we understand that Colorado has turned this roster over. Everyone understands that. This is not going to be last year's team. We all get it, Okay. But I just want you to think about not necessarily who they brought in. And we're going to talk about some of the players they brought in because there are some stars on this roster. There are some NFL players on this roster, okay? But I want to talk about just gen some, some general numbers as they relate to who they brought in, okay? Let's first talk about recruiting. Dion's first signing class. Now, this isn't uh indicative i don't think of what Dion's signing classes will be like in the future he wasn't hired to the end of the year signing day is in december so he didn't have time to put a full class together so under well you know i understand that they finished 29th in recruiting uh last year which is still really really good for colorado if you look at where they normally recruit i expect the recruiting in the future to be even better than that when Dion will have an entire year to meet with recruits and things like that so 29th in recruiting not bad okay what was included in that class of uh, uh, that, that, that was 29th in recruiting? These, these are players that will be freshmen this year. What's included in that class? I want you to think about some of these numbers here. One five-star, three four-stars. One five-star, three four-stars. And we're, these are freshmen we're talking about here. Cormani McLean being the, 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 the big name among them. There's a running back, too, in there we'll talk about in a minute. But, he, but Cormani McLean's the five-star right it's one five star three four stars that's four 
four blue chip players, okay? Now let's talk about the transfer portal because that's where the majority of the players came from. The majority of players that suit up and play significant time for Colorado in the fall this Saturday are going to be transfer portal players. Now their transfer portal class was ranked second. That is really good, second, all right? They brought in 51 players, 51. These are players who played in college last year. These are not true freshmen coming in, okay? These are, they could be sophomores, they could be fifth-year seniors, but these are players who were played college somewhere else last year and have transferred to Colorado, 51. That was good for the second-best transfer portal class. Just as a comparison, LSU had the highest-ranked portal class. So LSU was one in the transfer portal rankings for 23. Colorado was two. Colorado brought in 51 players. LSU brought in 14. 14. The 14 players that LSU brought in are better cumulatively, numbers-wise, than the 51 players that Colorado brought in. Almost four times the amount of players Colorado brought in at LSU. Among those transfers, one five-star is Travis Hunter, who came from Jackson State. Five four-stars. Now, then, again, these are players with college experience, and I'm expecting all of these players to, to play a lot or start, right? Okay, so that's one five-star, five four-stars. It's five blue chip players. That's five either four or five star players through the transfer portal. Five. 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 plus four true freshmen. That's nine. There are a total of nine four- and five-star players on Colorado's roster. I am not saying any of this to put down Dion, demean Dion, or the job they're doing there or whatever. This is remarkable compared to where Colorado as a team was last year. This is unbelievable. I am pointing these numbers out so that hopefully, like a big flashing sign, these people that are running around expecting Colorado to win eight, nine, or ten games and compete for the Pac-12 will understand exactly how stupid they sound now so that we all don't have to point it out to them in December. You are setting Dion up to fail. These people with the expectations of 9 and 10 wins on a team that has nine four- and five-star players. Nine. Nine. Georgia has nine four- and five-star offensive linemen. And I could go on, I could name Ohio State. I mean, nine. Nine. Nine, a total of nine four- and five-star players on this entire team. They're not going to be very good. There are in, That doesn't mean that Shador Sanders is a bad quarterback. Shador Sanders may have a great year. We're going to talk about the offense in a minute. Uh, Cormani McLean and Travis Hunter may be all Americans and future first-round draft picks. But as a team, Colorado is going to be absolutely horrible. Now, Probably not as horrible as last year. They might win three, four, five games. They might make a bowl game and go six and six. When you're run, when you are running around with the well, they're winning nine or ten games. Dion did it. You 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 sound like a complete moron, a complete buffoon, and you need to cut it out. All right, now that we got that out of the way, and I took a a, a thirty minute break to calm my happy ass down let's talk some Colorado football here's some numbers for you uh where do I have Colorado ranked I do a top 25 like everybody else does I don't have them ranked no one's got Colorado ranked they're unranked uh I mean they were there 133 teams in 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 between the power five and a group of five 
Colorado was like the 125th worst team, 130th. I mean, they were absolutely horrible. They were unranked. Um, nationally, where are they ranked? If you look around at some of the polls, whether you're talking ESPN preseason polls or uh, Fox Sports or Saturday Down South or On3 or whoever, everybody and their brother puts out these rankings. Where's Colorado in there? They're not there. They're unranked in, in every poll, whether it's mine or any other poll you look at. Uh, they're unranked. <coughs> Facts. Uh, over under win total. What's the win total expected to be for Colorado this year? This is a Vegas number. This is a betting number. So unlike you and me, this number is based on people who actually put their hard earned money on the line. Three and a half. That's the betting number for Colorado. If you think Colorado is going to win more than three and a half games, in other words, go uh, win four games or more, you'd bet the over. You think they're going to uh, going to win three games or less, you'd bet the under. Again, they were one and eleven last year. Expected win total this year three and a half. Uh, Heisman contenders. No, they don't have any. Um, Shador Sanders, like I said, may end up being a great quarterback. Um, I can't recall a, a quarterback winning the Heisman on a four-win team. Maybe you can. Let me know in the comments down below. But if you want to waste some money, you can actually bet uh, on uh, Shador Sanders. The odds are like $100 billion to one. But if you want to waste some money, you can put money on Shador Sanders to win the Heisman. He has the same odds as, as something called Chandler Morris. And what in the hell does that even say? Terry Benson, Trey Benson, Trey Benson. <laughs> Shador Sanders has the same odds as Chandler Morris and Trey Benson. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Lou, I don't even know who those people are. That's the point, dummy. Shador Sanders is not winning the Heisman. What about Colorado's odds to win the Pac-12? Again, something that has absolutely zero chance of happening, plus 10,000. If you're allergic to money, you can bet on Colorado to win the Pac-12. Their odds are plus 10,000, and believe it or not, those aren't the worst odds in the Pac-12. No, Stanford has even worse odds than that. But Colorado's next to last. So you got Stanford at a billion gazillion to one, and then you've got Colorado uh, at 10,000 to one. And then right ahead of Colorado is the juggernaut known as Arizona State. So those are the teams to uh, with the third worst odds to win the Pac-12. Colorado's in the middle of Stanford and Arizona State. National title? Jeez, boy, you just hate yourself here. But if you want to put money on Colorado winning the national title, any sports book in Vegas will be happy to punch you in the face and take it from you. Uh, the odds for Colorado to win the national title are plus 30,000. That's the 55th best odds in the country, which surprised me. I thought it would be uh, way worse. 55th best odds to win the Natty at plus 30,000. These are the exact same odds as Boise State. Duke, Syracuse, and Missouri. So, again, these are just Vegas numbers, betting numbers, people who actually put their money where their mouth is. These are where the odds have landed. Uh, these are where the odds are, have landed for Colorado. All right, we're going to talk about the offense and the defense for Colorado, but first let's talk about the coaches. Of course, head coach Deion Sanders. This is an unusual situation in that the head coach on this team, Deion Sanders, is the least experienced coach on the staff. It's a little unusual. Uh, usually head coaches have been around for a while, you know, kind of worked themselves up. Maybe they were a grad assistant somewhere, or maybe they played in the NFL for a while and then, you know, became a position coach somewhere and then maybe worked up to a coordinator somewhere and then maybe got a shot at, at head coach down the line. Uh, Dion, of course, took a different path. He's been at Jackson State as their head coach for the last couple of years, moves on to Colorado now, first year as a head coach there but I really like Dion's coaching staff I, I really like the staff he's put together especially the offensive staff I really like this guy they have uh this guy they have an offensive coordinator who they got from uh where did he come from Kent State uh, I'm not going to pretend to be a Kent State expert here but Georgia did play Kent State last year and their offense gave Georgia some trouble. Now, there's a couple of different reasons why that might have been, but Kent State had some good players, and they run a very interesting offensive scheme, Kent State did. And uh, this head coach for Kent State uh, is the guy that implemented that. I know I wrote his damn name down. I, you know when you can't read your own writing? Um, you know that's pretty bad. Sean Lewis, there you go. Sorry, can't read my own writing. So head coach Sean Lewis at Kent State becomes offensive coordinator now at Colorado. I really like this hire and a lot of the offensive hires for Colorado. Over on the defensive side of the ball, they brought in uh, 
from Alabama. What's his name? I probably can't read this either. Is it Charles Kelly? Charles Kelly. They brought in Charles Kelly from Alabama. Now, he's been around forever. He's bounced around from a lot of different schools. He was at Auburn for a while, uh, most recently Alabama, but he's been at Georgia Tech. He's been at Tennessee. He's been a lot of different places. He's been mainly a defensive coach. Uh, he spent a lot of time coaching defensive backs and specifically safeties. Uh, in addition to being the defensive coordinator at Colorado, he is going to be the safeties coach as well. So I think Dion has done a good job going out and assembling a staff uh, to try to work with this roster that they put together mostly through the transfer portal. All right, let's talk about Colorado's offense. Again, the Kent State offense is very unique. If you're a Colorado fan or if you're just interested in the type of offense that Colorado might be trying to run this year, Try to find some Kent State games on YouTube or somewhere and maybe watch uh, a quarter or a half of a Kent State game. But they run a very interesting offense. They're going to throw the ball, sling it around a lot. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch. Uh, of course, quarterback Shador Sanders, who's been one of the best FCS quarterbacks in the country the last couple of years now. Clearly, this is going to be a big step up in competition in terms of the defense as he's seeing from week to week. But I don't have any reason to think that Shador Sanders isn't going to be a good quarterback, even at the Power 5 level. How good? We'll see. Now, he's in a conference that's absolutely loaded this year at the quarterback position. But I do think it's possible Shador Sanders ends up being the fourth, fifth, sixth best quarterback in the Pac-12, something like that. You got Caleb Williams out there at Southern Cal. You got Bo Nix at Oregon. You got Michael Penix at Washington. Um, how much is Dante Moore going to play, if at all, at UCLA? That would be interesting. Uh, that would be interesting to see. But, you know, Shador Sanders is going to fall in line right around there, I think, in terms of the pecking order. Uh, quarterbacks in the Pac-12. I think he's really, really good. Uh, <clears throat> really good. Of course, uh, Dion brought him from Jackson State, but he's been one of the best quarterbacks in the FCS over the last uh, over the last couple of years. The wide receiver position, also going to be interesting to me because of Travis Hunter. And how much is he going to play? And is he going to be primarily a wide receiver or primarily a DB? I happen to think he's going to be primarily a DB and then play in spots at the wide receiver position. He's one of the best athletes in all of college football, the closest thing we've seen to a true uh, 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 two-way player in a while. Of course, Dion, probably the most famous two-way player of all time, playing professionally in the NFL and, and Major League Baseball at the same time. Uh, Bo Jackson played both, but it was generally one or the other. He would join, uh, he would join uh, 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 football late after baseball season ended, right? Dion was doing both at the same time. I think I mentioned in the beginning of this video, but as a kid, I remember watching Deion Sanders fly in a helicopter from a Major League Baseball game to an NFL game, or maybe it was the other way around. But he, used, he actually played an NFL game and a Major League Baseball game in the same day. Um, and Travis Hunter might be the closest thing we've seen to something like that in a long time. He's really, really good, in my opinion. I think he's a better defensive back than he is wide receiver, but my opinion doesn't count. I also think Colorado probably needs him more at the defensive back position than they do at wide receiver. They've got some other pieces at wide receiver that I think are going to do pretty well. Um, and in the Pac-12, uh, we're going to be facing a lot of those quarterbacks I just named. You're going to need a good secondary. If I was Dion, I would have tri uh, Travis Hunter's primary focus be the secondary and play him in some spots offensively, uh, offensively at wide receiver. And then what's going to be a recurring theme with pretty much every position group on Colorado's roster Colorado brought in several wide receiver transfers from the portal. Two of the more notable ones, Xavier Weaver and Jimmy Horn Jr. Do you recognize that name? Former NFL wide receiver Jimmy Horn, his son. Both of those guys came from South Florida. So, again, like the rest of the positions with Colorado, it's going to be filled in with mainly transfer portal players. Uh, what about the running back position? Cavassier Smoke! My buddy Cavassier Smoke from Kentucky. I've been watching him play the last few years, and I actually like him. He's a pretty good player. Um, and one of the greatest names in the history of college football, Cavassier Smoke, but he has transferred to Kentucky. And we talked a little bit about Colorado's recruiting class uh, earlier. We mentioned Cormani uh, McLean being a five-star at DB. The second highest rated player that they signed was actually uh, a running back, Dylan Edwards. And I think he's going to play a lot. He's uh, one of these, he's a little on the smaller side, but he, I, I guess he was what a lot of people would refer to as like a maybe a third down back. Uh, he's, he's a little on the smaller side, but man, this is the type of player, like you get him in space, he's really quick, really fast, has good hands. He's going to be exciting to watch at the running back position alongside uh, alongside Cavassier Smoke. And then they brought in, uh, what were those uh, 
He brought in somebody from Houston, too. Mackenhill, is that his name? I'm probably saying that wrong. But he brought a kid in from uh, Houston, too. So, again, cobbled together pieces at the running back position. But I actually like what they have there. Unlike a lot of positions in college football, r- the running back position is a position that is is fairly easy to transfer to uh, in terms of high school to college. Um, there's not a huge learning curve, I don't think, at the running back position from high school to college. If you can if you can read a running lane, you can read a running lane. If you can run a 4-3, you can run a 4-3, right? Um, you know, you can take a handoff off right tackle whether you're a senior in high school or a freshman. There's not – so you see a lot of freshman running backs play. So I think that Dylan Edwards is going to be good. We know Cavassier Smoke is a good player. Been watching him play for a couple of years down in the SEC at Kentucky. So I actually like Colorado's running back, uh, uh, running back room. Offensive line, to me, a big problem. Um, I think it's going to be a big problem. Uh, They kept three of the offensive linemen they had from last year's team. Now, how many that started? uh, Three of the starters from last year's team remained on the roster. Now, how many of those three are going to actually start or play? We won't know that until they kick things off in week one. But they brought in six transfers, all starters, but all from lower classification schools. No group, no power five. It was all group of five. Now, that doesn't mean they're not any good. I'm not saying they're not any good. These are all players with starting college experience. Offensive line, a lot like a puzzle. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily matter how good each individual player is. It's more about how they play as a unit. So it'll be interesting to see over the course of the next couple of months leading up to the start of the season how well this offensive line kind of comes together. Again, three returning starters from last year's Colorado team remain. Six come in from the transfer portal with starting experience. Unlike running back, not a good idea to play freshman offensive linemen if you can help it. So I'm assuming the starting five offensive linemen are going to come from some combination of those nine players. The three that remained from Colorado's team last year and the six they brought in with starting experience, we'll see. But if there's a weak spot on Colorado's offense, at least potentially, I would say it's the offensive line. All right, over on the defensive side of the ball, I already mentioned uh, Charles Kelly is their defensive coordinator, most recently at Alabama, but he's been all over the place from Tennessee to Georgia Tech to Auburn. He's been coaching since 1992. Very experienced guy. Again, I really like the coaching staff Dion has put together. In terms of the defense that Colorado is going to field this year on Saturdays, honestly, we really don't know. Outside of Travis Hunter at one corner and Cormani McLean at the other, we're not too certain who's going to play where, uh, who's going to start, who's going to be kind of a, a rotational guy. We really don't know. They have brought in transfers from all over the country at every single position group uh, on defense. They've brought in transfers from big schools like Alabama and Clemson. They've brought in transfers from small schools like Dartmouth, several from Jackson State, and everywhere in between. Um, now, I could go through and name a lot of these players. In fact, I wrote a lot of them down. I, I mean, I'd be happy to name some of these players. I'm just going to be honest with you. You're not going to recognize any of their names. The majority of these players that they brought in, again, this is not an indication that these players aren't going to be good. That's not what I'm saying. These were backup players at other schools, mostly, mostly, especially when you're talking about the ones from, you know, Arkansas, Clemson, Bama, the bigger schools like that. These were, uh, but again, check those recruiting classes. Those recruiting classes are great. The reality is backups and even third stringers on a defense like Bama or Clemson, over the last couple of years is a huge improvement over what Colorado was trotting out as starters every single year. So I think the defense is going to be better than last year. How much better is almost impossible to say. I've been doing these preview and prediction videos for, I think, six years now. This is by far the hardest team I've ever sat down to try to project for the coming year, at least in terms of, uh, uh, of who's starting where. Because you're just bringing in a bunch of pieces from all over the place, there's literally nothing returning from the previous year to point to. So outside of, you know, uh, the you know teachers' pets like Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter, who clearly Shador Sanders is going to be the starting quarterback, it's Deion's son. Which, by the way, I, I want to go out on I want to go on record here. This is a horrible idea. I don't think under any circumstances that a big time college football program. And you can say what you want about Colorado and whether they're big time or not. They're a power five program and a power five conference. I don't think a coach has any business recruiting or signing his children. 
I don't. I don't think there's any positive that can come of it. Uh, if he plays bad and they don't take him out, who get, you know, oh, well, of course he's not going to take him out. It's his own kid type of deal. I, I don't like it. And it's got nothing to do with Dion in particular. I've been yelling at Dabo Swinney about this for three years. How, yeah, I don't know. How, how many kids does Dabo Swinney have? They've all played for Clemson. None of them were any good. That's just the fact of the matter. It's just reality. And these were, they were scholarship players that are wasting a scholarship that somebody else could get. Now, Shador Sanders is good. I'm not saying he's not good. In fact, Shador Sanders is so good, he doesn't need to play for his daddy. He could play for someone else. There's lots of other teams that would love to have him. I just think it's a bad idea for big-time college football coaches to, to get into nepotism habit. I don't like it. I don't like the fact that Jackson Muschamp is on Georgia's roster. Now, he's a walk-on, and he was there before Will Muschamp was a coach at Georgia, so it's not exactly the same as some of these other situations, but I just don't like it when there are coaches' kids on the team in big-time college football, or on the coaching staff, for that matter. Um, nepotism ruined Oklahoma's defense seven, eight years ago, and it hasn't recovered yet uh, with one of the Stoops brothers there. It's ruined Iowa's offense with Kirk Ferentz hiring his son, to be the offensive coordinator. It damn near ran Mark Rick out of Miami before he even got moved in uh, when he hired his son to be the offensive coordinator there. Just a bad idea. Doesn't mean Shador Sanders isn't going to have a good year. I've tried to make it clear over and over in this video. I think there are some really good, talented, future NFL players on Colorado's roster. The problem is there's just not nearly enough. Again, if you don't remember any other stat that I talked about, and we're getting ready to go through the schedule now, there are only nine four- or five-star players on this entire roster. That's it, nine. So, yes, Shador Sanders, great. Travis Hunter, great. Cormani McClain, great. True freshman running back Dylan Edwards, great. You have 80 people that are three stars or below. So, it, it, just keep that in mind when we put this record up or we put the schedule up now. All right, here we go. I'm going to go through this thing game by game, and I'm going to give you a winner and a loser for every single week, and I'm going to give you a, a hint. There's going to be a lot of red boxes that pop up here. Um, <laughs> a tough schedule to start out. Dion is fighting uphill this year. Again, if you're one of these people that's running around expecting Colorado to win nine games, you are really hamstringing Dion. There's not a coaching staff on planet Earth that could win the Pac-12 with Colorado this year. I don't care if you hired Nick Saban as your head coach, Kirby Smart as your defensive coordinator, and Lincoln Riley as your offensive coordinator. You're not putting together a team in one year that can win it, and that goes for Dion as well. But y'all just setting yourselves up for disappointment here. But you start things off on the road at TCU. Last time we saw them, they were busy getting blown out by 60 points in the national title game. They do lose their quarterback and their best wide receiver. Uh, but that quarterback, who we all loved watching last year, Max Duggan or whatever the hell, we all loved watching him. He actually was not TCU's starting quarterback week one last year. Someone else was. They got hurt, and so Max Duggan went in and played the rest of the year. Well, that guy that got hurt, he's back. He's the starter. So I think they're going to be okay at the quarterback position, but they are going to uh, miss Quentin Johnson at wide receiver. Very well-coached team there. You got to play them there. Colorado starts out with an L. Deion Sanders loses game one. Back home to Nebraska, another team that is looking to turn things around. They've also made a coaching change in the offseason, bringing in Matt Rule, most recently of the Carolina Panthers, turned Baylor around prior to that. I think Nebraska is going to beat uh, going to beat Colorado. I like what they've done there. They're starting from a much higher uh, platform than Colorado is. These are both first-year coaches. But there's just a lot more to work with right now in Nebraska than there is at Colorado. It's great that they get this at home. This will be a crazy environment. Um, if nothing else, Dion's going to make a lot of money for Colorado. <coughs> All the games are sold out. The spring game was sold out. The merchandise sales are through the roof. The 11 or 12 Colorado fans that exist on planet Earth are just going absolutely nuts. Uh, but unfortunately for Dion, he starts 0-2 home loss uh, to Nebraska. Uh, then in-state rival Colorado State. I think Dion and Colorado pick up their first win of the season. I think you'll handle Colorado State without a burp, burp. You're, you're one and two. On the road at Oregon. Boy, the Pac-12 did y'all no favors this year. This is a loss. Not only is Oregon one of the uh, best teams in the Pac-12, I think a legitimate top 10 team this year. Bo Nix, a legitimate Heisman contender. You have to play them there, and it's one of the toughest environments in the entire Pac-12. Oregon will road grade you. You're one in three. 
you come back home and you get to play Southern Cal. What are they doing to Colorado? The Pac-12 has just totally rammed it in uh, to Colorado and Coach Prime in year one. This is just brutal. Southern Cal will beat you by about 40. You've got no chance to win that game. Uh, you're one in four. Is that right? Wow. On the road at Arizona State and then back home against Stanford. These are two games that Colorado will win if they are improved at all over last year. I mean at all. These are two bad teams. Really bad. Really bad. Can Colorado beat both of these teams, Arizona State and Stanford? I'm going to say they go one and one. I, I, I do think potentially they could win both of these games. I'm going to split the difference. I'm going to go one and one. I'm going to give you a win at home against Stanford and a loss on the road at Arizona State, I guess. But that could easily be uh, easily be flipped. But, hey, that's two wins. You've already doubled your win total from last year, and you're only halfway through the season. Let's go. All right, you come off your bye week. You got to go on the road and play the fight in Chip Kelly's. That's a giant L. You're going to lose that one on the road at UCLA. Come back home, play Oregon State. They won 10 games last year. Could win 10 games again this year, more likely eight or nine, but it's possible. In any case, one of those wins is going to be against Colorado. You're losing to the Beavers. And then there's Arizona. And this is not a gimme game. Uh, Of the two Arizona schools, I like Arizona better heading into 2023 than I do Arizona State. It is a benefit that you get them at home. So you know what I'm going to do? You play them and then at Washington State. Again, I think these are two teams that if Colorado is really that much better than last year's Colorado team, these are two teams Colorado can beat. I'm going to split the difference. I'm going to say you beat Arizona at home and lose on the road at Washington State and then your regular season finale, which will be your season finale on the road at Utah, probably the most physical team in the Pac-12, maybe second most physical. And the area I'm worried about the absolute most, well, there's two areas I'm worried about the most, I guess, tied for first place in terms of most worried for me uh, when it comes to Colorado. There are lines of scrimmage on both sides of the ball and depth and the depth especially the later the season goes on is going to become more and more of an issue for Colorado right when they get injuries when they lose starters the players that they've got in reserve to put in in other words their backups um not good uh not good at all but I'll give you a a a loss there on the road at Utah State so let's see how many wins is that uh how many wins is that that we just came up with for Colorado let's see uh Colorado State uh, you're going to beat either Arizona State or or Stanford. That's two wins. Doubled your win total right there from last year. Lose to UCLA, lose to Oregon State. Three. Wow, three wins. I've got Colorado at three and nine for 2023. The Vegas win number is three and a half. Bet the under, make yourself some money. Deion Sanders may end up being a great coach. Colorado may get things turned around and become a ranked team at some point in the future. However, unfortunately for the uh, prime stands that are out there, none of those things are happening this year. Deion Sanders is going to get absolutely humiliated the majority of Saturdays this fall. Colorado is going to be terrible. And I, for one, am extremely interested to see how he handles these post-game press conferences after games where he's getting blown out by 30 and 40 points. Have a great day.